outside our window and the birds are chirping all around in this happy little rural southern town hello and welcome to rusty water towers the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry i'm your host jonathan lamaster smith or as folks often call me dr j Each episode of the podcast, I talk with the guest about their experiences in rural life and ministry as we search the stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that I believe are latent in rural communities. My guest today is the Reverend Philmont Bostic, a pastor and PhD student who I had the privilege of advising for his MDiv program. He currently lives in the Seattle area in the Pacific Northwest, but has spent time in East Tennessee, Alaska, Texas, and many other places. We'll get to know Philmont soon. But first, let's jump into our song. Each week, we have a Come With a Country music recommendation about rural life. So, I think this song, The Gambler, feels like a song that operates outside of time. Kenny Rogers is known for uh, surreal surreal songs, blending modern, western, and some psychedelic work from his 70s and 80s, and and he offers some interesting perspective on that. The song begins... On a warm summer's evening on a train bound for nowhere, I met up with a gambler. We were both too tired to sleep. So we took turns of staring out the window at the darkness. The boredom overtook us, and he began to speak. He said, Son, I've made a life out of reading people's faces and knowing what the cards were by the way they held their eyes. So if you don't mind my saying, I can see you're out of aces for a taste of your whiskey. I'll give you some advice. And eventually, we get to the famous chorus. You got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. You got to know when to walk away and know when to run. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. So my experience with this song, well, I feel like I just regularly hear this song just randomly on the radio or in Spotify playlists, or it's, it's a good karaoke song for a lot of people. Uh, but w- what I run into with it and what I've, what I'm experiencing out of it as I'm reflecting on it, it, it is that it's a, uh, the value of engaging strangers. So they're on a train to nowhere. This is the benefit of a song operating outside of time. It feels like they're just going somewhere. It doesn't really matter where they're going. And it comes from a sing- the singer's perspective. The gambler can tell the singer is out of aces, down on his luck. That's the, I mean, that's his job to read faces. And when the gambler shares his advice, I feel that I feel like it's simple, and yet it's so, uh, important enough to wash over the singer. It, it, it gives him a sense of life a sense that he can go on. I think it really might not have mattered what the gambler had said so much as he recognized someone's pain, reached out in a way that the singer could understand. I mean, he was willing to trade trade advice and conversation for whiskey and cigarettes. He acknowledged his presence, his pain, and gave him some of his time and some words that may have helped him keep going. The gambler breaks Evelyn, pass, passes on, made a difference. It doesn't really matter what happens to the gambler. The singer is the one the song is now about. He keeps going because of the advice of a stranger on a train that engaged him. I know that I'm apparently approachable and people just randomly come and talk to me. I've been on planes and buses and trains and restaurants uh, and people just come up and start talking to me. They'll, I'm, apparent, I'm approachable, a friendly face, which is great. And it really helps for me as a professor or a pastor that people can come and talk to me, that I'm not someone who's terrifying and hard to talk to. Uh, but it's also not as much fun necessarily when you're on a plane or a bus and you're stuck with someone and they find out you're a professor of theology or a pastor and they start asking questions that you were not prepared to answer. I digress. One thing we can learn from the gambler is he didn't just engage. He seemed to connect with the singer in a way that he saw who he was. He connected with the singer and offered him life beyond a train headed nowhere. Like always, I'll add this to our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. Now... Let's take time to get to know our guest. Philmont, each time we gather, we ask uh, our guest uh, what their experience is, w- is with this song. So what's been your experience with this song? Uh, very similar to you. Um, not a big country music person, but I know I've heard this song probably more times than any other country song. And uh, it's always been good advice. And I've probably even told somebody, hey, man, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Mm-hmm. And so... It's uh, it's one of those uh, transcendent things, you know. Some songs trans- transcend genre; they transcend uh, background and culture, mm-hmm. and it's pretty good advice to pass on to somebody else. 
Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. So thank you. Uh, so now I want you to just tell us a little bit about yourself. I gave a brief introduction, but I want to tell the listeners more about yourself, who you are, where you're from, uh, what your life has been like. Well, uh, let's see. My name is Phil Mott Bostic. Uh, I'm very familiar with rural living. I was born in Marlboro County, South Carolina. If you know if we're calling it by the entire county, you can tell it's not that big. <laughs> uh, both my parents are from Marlboro County. Um, it's a, Marlboro County is a rural, uh, mostly agricultural mm. um, and manufacturing uh, community. So pretty familiar to a lot of Southern people. Uh, mm -hmm. My grandfather on both sides were sharecroppers at one point. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, know about rural life. Um, and But uh, my father joined the military, so we moved around a good little bit, spent some time in uh, Georgia, Hinesville area, which is a little bit south of Savannah. Um, also, um, personally, as far as rural connections, mm -hmm. I pastored in Fairbanks, Alaska for almost four years. So mm. I don't know if you can get too much more rural than that. Ah. <laughs> then uh, spent two years in Johnson City, Tennessee, which was more, it was rural, but had a more, it's more, uh, you know, small mm -hmm. town feel so it's kind of yeah. a different different experience but um been pastoring for over 10 years um mm -hmm. have uh been you know continually working on my education as you said i'm working on my phd from palm beach atlantic university um married for the last for over 10 years mm -hmm. uh me and my wife have two kids together i have four kids total just had a birthday recently so excited happy about birthday Thank you. Excited about seeing another year of life. And so uh, that's pretty much me. I pastor a church here in the Auburn area, which is south of Seattle. Um, been here for only a couple months. New new thing, new exciting thing. So kind of went from a, uh, just left from Dallas, so kind of went from an urban to a suburban. Mm -hmm. I think I've pastored in almost all different contexts. So that's mm -hmm. a little bit about me. Great, great. Well, what we're going to do is take a little break, and then we'll get into more talking about some of the experiences of rural hope you have. So we'll be back right after this. Hi there, Jonathan here, and I'm recording this ad to tell you about a resource from the Hinton Rural Life Center. My wife, Shannon, and I have partnered with Hinton to create the Theotokos Connections Confirmation Curriculum for small rural churches. We designed this curriculum with rural youth programs in mind, where you really want to connect their teenagers with the culture, heritage, and place on top of the faith you're trying to instill through the confirmation program. There are six sessions that focus on topics like connecting to self, God, history, church, place, and creation. Each unit has either a Bible story, like the story of Mary or the story of Samuel, or a historical figure like Richard Allen or Harriet Tubman, to engage with as part of the experience. But this experience is not just a sit and listen and do a paperwork kind of confirmation. It's an active and connective confirmation program. You might be headed to a museum, helping prepare for a church spaghetti supper, learning new prayer practices, assisting in worship, or volunteering at the local mission agency. It is designed with rural culture and rural life in mind. You can do this in six weeks, six months, and you can do them in most any order or form you want to engage and I'll tell you, I, I'm pretty sure it's not just youth programs using this curriculum. I've seen other people get it for their college ministries, as well as perhaps using it as adult confirmation or adult refresher on Methodist and rural culture and life. And you know, if you have other trusted confirmation curriculum you want to pair it with, go ahead. This is a very customizable program. So if you want to bring other lessons from a different program you've used or things you've written yourself, feel free to blend them in. This is also a very affordable program and you pay per student, not for a lump sum curriculum that you may not use all the pieces of, or you may not use but once every two or three years. And this is designed to make it affordable and accessible for you. And it pairs well with Hinton's Theotokos confirmation retreats that happen in the spring. For more information on the curriculum or to place an order, check out hintoncenter.org slash theotokos or hintontheotokos.org for more information. Thanks. Welcome back. So, Phil Mott, the reason I ask you on is because I want to hear your stories. I want to know what your stories and rural experiences are, where you've found hope, where you've seen stories that matter, or even maybe some of your frustrations if you've had those. Uh, share, share with us what you want to. Uh, 
Well, let me, I guess I'll start. Um, we'll maybe we'll start negative and then move into the positive. Sounds okay. good. I, I like to end on a good note. Um, one of the challenges of rural life, I think, is the you definitely see some lack of hope. And here's what I mean: I grew up in a little small town in South Carolina, and a lot of my mm. family lives, still lives there. A lot of people I went to high school still went lived there, and they nothing wrong with embracing rural life, but there's also should be some hope that things are going to get better. And mm -hmm. uh, since I've left <laughs> the town I grew up in, they have lost the hospital. They no longer have a hospital mm. in that town. That's very common in rural spaces. Yes, I'm noticing that. Um, so the nearest hospital is 15, 20 minutes away. Uh, the utilities continue to rise, even though I've seen so many solar fields. I don't know if you mm. noticed this in North Carolina. You've seen all oh, these yeah, solar everywhere. fields everywhere. But yet and still, people's electric bills are going up. Mm -hmm. um, you also see... Um, a lot of the manufacturing jobs are leaving in Marlboro County. One of the plants that even my grandmother worked at for a long time mm -hmm. officially closed up, I think, either last month or this month. And then another one that's uh, that Sopaco, which makes MREs for the military, I think they're mm. moving to another oh. location. And so mm -hmm. you're living in these areas where the jobs continue to leave. No new ones are coming in, mm. but it seems like nobody cares at the top, if you get what I'm saying, the top mm -hmm. of society doesn't seem to be affected by this, but it affects all the other people. And I feel like sometimes the people in the bottom are not coming together to force things to happen because mm -hmm. I do believe at one point in time, Magic Johnson was trying to open up a youth center in town and wow. people came and blocked the youth center for some other crazy reason. And I'm asking my mom, I'm like, why are y'all, why are, is your power bill going up so much if they're building all these solar panel fields? Mm. Well, I don't know. We're part of the co-op. I'm like, why don't y'all fight back against the? And it seems like they just accept it. That's just the way it is. And it seems like they see they they behave as, as if they're hopeless. If that makes mm. any sense. And so that's one of the challenges of rural life. You can see a lot of people. They just accept whatever's going mm -hmm. on. They feel like there's no point in bucking the system. They have to just take it. And I just feel like. That doesn't speak to the God that I serve, the God that we serve, that there's there's never any hope. And so mm -hmm. that's probably my biggest, that's probably the negative thing of, of rural life is trying to get people to see beyond themselves, see beyond their current situation. That's that there's so something important. greater out of there. That is so important. Thank you. And when it, yeah, when you're speaking to hope, that's the number one thing. You have to see something beyond mm -hmm. where you are. Um, but where I do see positives in rural, in rural areas is the rural areas still have that sense of community. Mm. Right? Yes. Um, if you're, you know, if I know somebody, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> now we're quote unquote cousins and I'm mm -hmm. gonna help you out, look out for you and do things for you. And a lot of times people from rural communities have been my biggest cheerleaders, even though I've pastored in places and moved on, they still keep up with me. They still check in with me. They'll still uh, call me. Um, I just had my installation service for a new church that I met recently. And my buddy who I pastored with in Alaska flew down from Alaska to come and support oh, that's me. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Which, you know, speaks to the community that you develop in rural in rural areas. And mm -hmm. so I think that that's the positive of rural areas. And that's the hope a lot of times that you see in rural people. Ah, oh, yes. That's that's very real. That's very real. So any particular stories of your experiences in your rural, your, your rural spaces that come to mind? Yeah, one of the... Um, most, prof I think it's probably one of the pro profound uh, experiences that I had. And it's really pushed me in my ministry was, uh, the buddy I was talking about, Ben Bohart, uh, we pastored two churches that were right next door to each other in Alaska and mm. our churches had some issues because the church that I pastored was in the building of the church that he pastored. They got kicked out of the building. Oh, uh, they were part of the United Methodist denomination. The United Methodists kicked them out. And so they ended up building a whole new church oh. right next door to where their old church was. Hmm. So imagine, even though you're in this new building, you still can see every day the old building that you poured all this time and energy into. Right? Wow. So there, needless to say, there were some conflicts between the two churches. And me and him decided most of this stuff happened before all this stuff happened before we arrived. We were going to move together in Christian brotherhood. And so. Um, ben, in all his wisdom, taught me into going around the neighborhood, inviting people to church. Now, I don't know if you didn't think, know anything about Alaska, but um, everybody in Alaska carries a gun. 
and it's usually not for personal protect. It's usually, it's for personal protection, not always for people. Sometimes from wild animals. Yes, uh, as is know. the case in most rural areas. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You need a you need a weapon to protect you from something. Yes. And so we had moose, we had bear, <laughs> you know, there were some things out there that could harm you. And so we went to this lady's house and we knocked on her door and she opened the door and, you know, we explained that we're two pastors from two different churches and we were just inviting her to church. And she was like, she was confused. She was like, so which church are you inviting me to? We're like, we're not, we don't care per se. <laughs> yes. We're inviting you to church in general. Mm -hmm. You can go to his church, you can go to my church, you can go to another church. We're just inviting you to have yeah. a relationship with Jesus. And this is what she said, and I thought it was so profound. She said, hold on. You guys are two pastors from two different churches inviting people to church. It's crazy for people to act like Christians on this side of heaven. Wow. And that stuck with me mm -hmm. um, ever since then. And because what, it, what, it, what she was conveying is that, uh, that isn't it crazy that we try to act like Christian brotherhood, this side of heaven, you know, we all want to go to heaven and I don't think there's going to be any segregation in heaven. Like there's going to be, Oh, this is Baptist heaven. This is Pentecostal heaven. Mm -hmm. oh, this is Methodist heaven. We're all going to yeah. be in the same heaven, worshiping the same God. So why don't we try to do that a little bit here on earth? And so that's been kind of the drumbeat of my ministry ever since then of trying to mm -hmm. bring people together from different cultures and backgrounds. And so mm -hmm. the Lord's kind of put me on that path to really do that. And I think that that's one of the that's one of the one of the more profound experiences that I had uh, in a rural setting, and that and just you know rural people are some of the sweetest people in the world. The mm -hmm. church I pastored in Tennessee, uh, a bunch of really sweet little old ladies who did not want their church to close and was mm -hmm. fighting tooth and nail to do it. I went there knowing it was going to be a challenge and did, and and did the best I could, and I think. One of the other things that I learned from that experience was it taught me that you need to have realistic expectations a lot of times mm. of what you think your church can be. Um, yes. Especially in a town, you know, we were in a town of 60,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so, and there was probably over a hundred churches in that town of 60,000. And that's, so that's the rural South. Right. And so you're thinking to yourself, <laughs> okay, realistically, if we got to 60 people in this church, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's, you know, that's probably a sustainable, good, you know, good sustainable number. Mm -hmm. And so it really taught me to kind of each church has its own perspective and things that you have to learn. And the church is still going. They have a new pastor who followed me. She's doing a marvelous job of trying to keep the church going. Great. But what it also taught me, too, is, is that the idea that I was talking about earlier about thinking outside of yourself is really hard because it was hard for them to grasp the concept. We had a church of maybe 10 or 12 people. Mm. sitting in an edifice that used to uh that had occupancy of 300 oh yeah that's ter that's when you're in that space and you're just a few people and it's just the overwhelmingness of the space and they like and they also like to spread out they didn't like to sit next to oh yeah so. it's their spot they've set in growing up so there's they're just like all over and you're having to look all the way around right and so imagine you're sitting out mm -hmm. seeing 10 you walk into a church you're seeing mm -hmm. 10 people in a church that can sit 300 the building was tearing down and they just didn't have the finances nor the, at this point, a lot of them were older. Um, mm -hmm. and some of them have since passed on since I moved away. They just didn't have the, the you know, the, the get up and go to do it anymore. And so mm -hmm. trying to get them to, I was talking to them about, Hey, um, and maybe if I had been there a little bit longer, I probably could have got them to do it. I said, Hey, why don't we look at selling this building? Cause the church next to us wanted to buy the building. Cause it was kind of adjacent to their property and they were buying up the whole, that whole neighborhood anyway. Why don't we just sell mm -hmm. this building, downgrade to something smaller, a little bit more manageable. We could use the money from the sale to set up an endowment to help, you know, make sure the, you know, make sure Pay the church ministries, stays, yeah. yeah, make sure the church stays going on for, for a long period of time. And so that, you know, that whole idea of trying to see people, get people to see beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're called to do as a pastor. And sometimes it's hard, especially in rural communities, because this is all I know. I grew up here. I remember this person working on this and there's so many memories mm -hmm. and stuff tied to the building or tied to that area that we we forget that we're called to, you know, keep this thing going as long mm -hmm. as possible. Those were some positives and some challenges I saw, in, you know, in my experiences in rural communities. With each guest, I like to ask them to bring a piece of media there that is giving them hope right now, whether it's music or movies, TV, books, anything you want to share with us. Um, 
giving us hope right now. Um, in preparation for this, I know how much you love music. And so I thought of two songs that I kind of listen to mm-hmm. when I'm feeling a little uh, down or depressed. Um, there's mm-hmm. a song by a group called Nappy Roots, mm-hmm. a song called Po Folks, um, featuring, uh, featuring Anthony Hamilton. And uh, the, the chorus goes, all my life I've been Po, but it really doesn't matter no more. Wonder how we act this way. Nappy boy is going to be okay. And it's basically, even though they're living in this rural, mm-hmm. the, the, the group is from Kentucky and they're talking mm-hmm. about living life in rural Kentucky and just explaining that even though life in rural Kentucky is not easy, mm-hmm. it's going to be okay. We're going to find a way to make it. Uh, we're going to overcome whatever the situation we're in. Yes. Another one is from one of my favorite groups, um, Outcast. They have a song called Get Up, Get Out, and Get Something. And it's kind of like a call to action to, mm-hmm. to, to especially to, I would say, the younger people. Um, Mm -hmm. Because when they wrote this song, it's from the 90s. So they were kind of just getting on the scenes. And what they were referring to is, you know, you have a lot of people who are just sitting around doing nothing. And it's like, no, you need to get up, get out and get something. And the chorus goes, Mm -hmm. it's been all your days trying to get high. (laughs) You need to get up, get out and get something because you and I have to do for you and I. So especially in the black community, we understand a lot of times that only way we're going to get opportunities, we have to create those opportunities. And so... Mm -hmm. It's a call to action, especially the young black youth. Like, hey, you can't just sit around here being a bum. You have to get up and get out and do some things because that's what's going to push us forward. Yes. These are older songs. These are these are not, not nothing contemporary at the moment, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, I just talked about Kenny Rogers from the 1970s. So I know. Yeah. I'm just, <laughs> so if anybody listened to this, they was like, those songs are, from, those songs are old. I'm, I'm 40. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to back to it. You know, right. The things that, you know... I'm probably going to go listen to some stuff from the old, you know, older music than I am newer music at this point in time. Well, it's stuff that you've carried with you for a while. It's not, it's, yeah. I mean, so, sure, you'll hear some brand new music that'll give you hope too, but if it's this the thing you go back to regularly. Right. These mm-hmm. are, you know, especially those, the Dapper Root song every so often, but that get up, get out and get something um, really spoke to me, especially as, uh, I think the song, I can't remember when in the 90s it came out, but especially getting ready to go through high school, getting ready to go off, to, you know, go off into the real world. You understood. You couldn't just sit around. You know, I understood. I wasn't going to sit around here in Marlboro County forever. I need to get up, get out, and get something. And mm-hmm. so, even this pursuit of this PhD is kind of a, it's a reminder, of, of that same ideology that I developed back then. That I don't want to remain where I am. I got, I'm trying to push myself forward. And so, even so, like I, you know, somebody asked me recently. Why are you trying to get a PhD anyway? You're just getting yourself into a whole bunch of debt and then you're going to leave your kids a bunch of debt behind you and all this other stuff. And I said, the bachelor's is for my mom because I promised her I was going to do that. Mm-hmm. The master's is for the church, the church in general, because mm-hmm. that's what they said I needed in order to, ha- you know, the pastor. But this PhD is for me. It reminds mm-hmm. me a little black boy who came out of rural South Carolina. Mm-hmm to educationally get to this point is very mm-hmm. rare air for anybody in my neck of the woods. Yeah. And, you know, wow. And so I, I'm trying to be inspiration, if not purposely, but on, you know, on accident that, Hey, this guy went to Marlboro County high school. He ended up getting a PhD. Maybe I could do the same thing. Exactly. That's, that's so powerful and so important. Well, Thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed talking with you. I mean, we actually probably talked for a good 30 minutes before we actually started recording. Is there any place that our listeners can find you? Social media, email, website? Um, there's, you can, um, websites, filmopbostic.com. Mm-hmm. I'm on Facebook, um, probably more regular than anything else, Twitter. Um, everything's Film Op Bostic. <laughs> nice, <laughs> having, nice. a unique, having a unique name helps. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, I'm on there a little bit. Um, I'm on TikTok a little bit. You can see mm-hmm. some stuff on there. Um, YouTube, I'm on YouTube. Um, you could find you could find me on that. Just pretty much search Philmont Bostic, and if anybody pops up, it's more likely me. <laughs> so that's how you could find me. You can visit my church website, West Valley Church, uh, West Valley Community Church.com. You'll be able to see us and what we're doing here in the Auburn area, and so. Yeah, that's where you can reach us or on Facebook and on Twitter. And we have a TikTok too. Yeah, you can find Excellent. West Valley on all that. Excellent. 
All right. So thank you, Phil Mott. I, you can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get podcasts. If you have questions or suggestions for guest topics or just want to say hi, you can reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and you can send us an email at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to Shannon Lamaster Smith for our theme music. Hildebrand is the name of the song. I record and produce this podcast because of my hope that it lifts up faith and life in rural communities. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. I live across the railroad tracks in a little lighthouse. Must you pass? If you weren't trying to find me Many of the trees are dead There's stumps in the ground In a great big yard Across from the fire station